In 1865, on the eve of the discovery of the greatest deposits of diamonds and gold ever found, South Africa was a thinly populated and poor country, consumed by bitter struggles over its limited amount of arable land. Europeans have begun arriving both in South Africa and North America during the 17th century. But for every hundred Europeans who moved to North America, only one European came to South Africa. By 1865, 63 miles of railroad had been built in the country. 35,000 miles had been built in the United States. New York City's population at this time was more than one and a quarter million. Cape Town, to which its bishop and chaplain are being returned after pastoral duties of the then leper colony of Robben Island, was South Africa's largest town with a population of 30,000. None, neither black, nor white, nor colored, could have imagined the changes that were about to take place that would transform their lives and the lives of their children and bring a sudden end to many lives. It was near this spot in 1870, on an arid, windswept plateau, 600 roadless miles from Cape Town, where vertical, earthbound columns of bluish rock produced by volcanic activity had broken surface, the diamonds were discovered, in quantity never before matched. Sixteen years later, in 1886, gold was discovered 300 miles further inland in the Transvaal. The Transvaal was, at this time, but would not long remain, an independent country, inhabited by descendants of the Fortrekkers and the mixed farmers whom they had conquered. Nothing like the South African diamond and gold fields had ever been discovered before. The gold consisted not of nuggets, but of microscopic bits hidden in an uneven cylinder or reef of rock that had broken surface at the discovery site, but twisted and bucked underground for 400 kilometers reaching depths of two miles, depths never before reached by miners. Eventually, 40% of all the gold ever mined would be recovered from this reef. A tiara of cities would rise above it. South Africa was completely unprepared to make full use of these two Eldorados. Homegrown black and white and colored diggers could just scratch the top. They could not reach deep. The outside world supplied those who could reach deep. People with deeper pockets than any pockets in South Africa. The outside world, Britain, Australia, Canada, Germany, America, and elsewhere, supplied the mine owners and mine managers and men with deep level mining knowledge, experience, and skills. They came in the thousands in a wave that grew into hundreds of thousands. Teachers, lawyers, accountants, engineers, chemists, nurses, haberdashers came from Germany, Lithuania, America, and other places. A branch of the Western industrial economy migrated to South Africa. The number of white foreigners entering the country between 1875 and 1904 was greater 
than the number of homegrown whites at the beginning of this period. In the United States, during its period of most rapid industrialization, immigrants constituted a small fraction of the inhabitants. In South Africa, the existing population was confronted with and eventually absorbed in a new economy almost completely organized and worked by foreigners. In addition to whites who came by sea, black immigrants came by land. From as far away as the mountains of the moon in Central Africa, to work in the mines, often never to return home. It is estimated that they numbered half a million, more even than the number of white newcomers. All, black and white, engineers and laborers, were quickly organized to perform the roles the worldwide investors required. On the treeless digging sites were no building materials. Wood planking was hauled from more than 500 miles away. Some boards bearing inscriptions from previous use, like the queue a bishop brought in to officiate at the last ceremony for a leading citizen of the diamond town received from the coffin at his feet. Please keep away from the boiler. The foreigners ate foreign food, bread, baked from imported flour, frozen meat from the Argentine, condensed milk from Europe and America, even the unpalatable dried vegetables on which they had to rely were only slowly supplanted by produce from market gardens established also by newcomers. At first, many homegrown people were able to participate in the construction of the industrial economy as haulers of people, haulers of food to feed them, and a great variety of supplies and materials. But their participation as transport riders was brief. Construction of rail lines began almost immediately from all four South African ports all heading for the diamond fields. After reaching Kimberley, they were pushed on in 1886 towards the Witwatersrand and its gold. While the rail lines were advancing, the new economy was being centrally organized with its own command structure, separate from the state. Geologists had been learning more and more about the great dimension of the underground gold-bearing reef that had outcropped. It would take a lot of money to follow it deep underground, and to extract minute quantities of gold from huge quantities of ore. And it would cost many lives. But the returns promised to be greater than the material expense. Foreign investors and organized teams of foreign investors bought most of the shares issued by the companies that replaced the individual diggers. But the process of centralization under one large company had already begun on the diamond mines. As the hole eating into the volcanic cores deepened, rock falls increased, some causing fatalities. Water seepage was becoming flooding. Claim boundary markers washed away. Disputes increased and escalated. A man who, as a 17-year-old, had come from England to South Africa to try to cure his tubercular lungs, solved the problems at the diamond field. This is a photo of him just prior to his departure from England. A few years later, when the flooding became insupportable, he was there, selling pumps. Everyone who hadn't yet given up needed pumps. Kimberley now sits at the edge of its first diamond mine, long played out and flooded. The claims of the increasing number of defeated diggers were highly negotiable. The young man, still young, was buying up their claims and the claims of other claims buyers with money pocketed from the pumps and money supplied by one of Europe's leading investment banks. This man, Cecil Rhodes, would go on to become, 
head of the world's leading diamond and gold mining corporations. Also, Prime Minister of Britain's Cape Colony. Also, Commander-in-Chief of a company police force, the British South Africa Company Police, with at least 500 troopers, a force that he used to create company countries, named after him, Northern and Southern Rhodesia, now Zambia and Zimbabwe. Powerful as he was, he was an agent of a system that was more powerful, and to which he too was answerable. Shareholders required the mines be provided with all necessary supplies at the lowest possible cost, including labor. The price of gold was set by Western Central Banks, not by Rhodes and the mining corporations. As the price was fixed, the degree of profitability would be determined by the ability of directors and managers to keep expenses down. The price of skilled miners was impossible to keep down, due to the fact that the class of deep level miners did not exist in South Africa. It had to be imported, along with most other skilled workers. The machinery also had to be imported, another inflexible expense. Hundreds of thousands of tons of useless rock had to be extracted, crushed, put through a poisonous chemical procedure before the hidden grains of gold became visible. The one essential expense which could be controlled and would have to be controlled if South African gold mining with its low-grade ores was to be run at a profit was the wage paid to the bulk of the labor force, the hundreds of thousands of men needed to actually blast the rock, move it, and complete most of the processing. These men were, by upbringing, African mixed farmers, both foreign and homegrown. The wage set for them, according to an industry statement, was a wage insufficient to meet rent and other expenses that would permit the miner to live with his family in the mining towns. Instead, the companies would provide African miners with single-sex hostels on company property. Durable concrete bunks and stoves. Here a miner has punched cardboard with holes for his spoons to be hoisted to the ceiling. The companies would provide a vegetable mixture together with maize meal porridge served twice a day. Time for recreation and rest. The miner would be able to visit his family after six months, or twelve months, or eighteen months, depending on the terms of his contract. Wives and children away in rural areas would need to take care of themselves, helped in many cases by remittances from husbands and sons. Remittances would not always be coming. Since 1911, 69,000 miners, mostly mixed farmers, referred to as natives or kaffirs by white people, lost their lives in mining accidents. How many died from the lung disease Tysis after returning home is not known. Pressure hoses began to be used in an effort to damp down the dust, yet, according to the Chamber of Mines, in 1958, 900 men died of disease before they had left the mines. We will see later how the mines obtained that large part of their labor force that wouldn't have shown up voluntarily for the prevailing wage in the dust-filled air. But first, we look at what happened to many Afrikaners unexpectedly confronted by a worldwide economic force and among the first to receive a violent military shock from it. Within one year of the discovery of diamonds on disputed land claimed to lie within its territory by the Orange Free State, London instructed its officials in South Africa to establish a boundary that brought Kimberley within British jurisdiction. 
but the gold-bearing reef lay on lands belonging indisputably to a state whose independence had been recognized internationally. The Transvaal, officially the South African Republic, was a vast area with adequate rainfall only in the eastern parts, the so-called bushveld. Most was drier land, going into desert. It supported only about 40,000 whites when gold was discovered, most of them patriarchal herders thinly spread out over more than a hundred thousand square miles, their families many days ride from each other, maintaining their herds and flocks. Also in their households were colored servants whom they had brought with them on the great trek, during the course of which they had dispossessed the former owners of the land, who were also now their servants. Their families were large. There was no social security, no police, no hospitalization. Necessarily large. But it meant that little was left for any one son once an inheritance had been divided up. There were already white men without land of their own, who made do by helping out on someone else's land and eating at his table. As a result of land hunger, pressure to obtain more land was unrelenting against the remaining African chieftains that were still independent. Many landless and poor whites enlisted in the government commando to apprehend and punish a Mapoch chief whom they accused of murdering his half-brother. Members of the defeated tribe sat to witness the chief's hanging before these people were dispersed throughout the Republic as laborers and servants in white pastoralist households. The Mapach's well-watered lands were surveyed to ready them for new ownership, as had been anticipated by the commando's members. Ownership was decided by a foot race to stake out the individual claims. This because a foot race would put all on an equal plane, as some owned horses. One of the resulting farms was named Karl Kopp, or Bearhead, on account of the owner having lost his hat in the race and not waiting to pick it up had reached a still open claim without it. The President of the South African Republic had been born in the little Cape Colony village of Colesburg, as painted here in about 1900. He was Paul Kruger. He had forded the Orange River as an 11-year-old foretrekker and helped his elders defeat earlier conquerors of the people of the plains beyond the Vaal River, including Mzilikazi's Matabili. He was a Dopa, a member of the fundamentalist branch of the Dutch Reformed Church. In his memoirs, he explains that the name was probably derived from Dop, a damper for putting out candles. Quote, the meaning would seem to be that just as a dope extinguishes a candle, so the dopers extinguished all new thoughts and opposed all progress. History had shaped the minds of the white pastoralists. They had escaped from an oppressive pharaoh, his armies and his minions. They were not educated much by books except the Bible, but they knew about Lord Kimberley, the British colonial secretary, who had issued instructions that the diamond mines were to be made British territory, overriding the claim by the Orange Free State. Word of mouth had conveyed to them how it was done, and the name of the British governor who carried out Lord Kimberley's instructions, two of the minions of the female pharaoh, Victoria. They had followed in the path of the children of Israel, hungry desert refugees who had crossed a river into land inhabited by worshippers of idols and practitioners of witchcraft. They had smitten these enemies, they had established themselves in the land with God's help. They finally had their own country. Its capital was Pretoria, a small town. Most had never seen a city, any city, 
ten years after the discovery of the reef, there were a hundred thousand people of all races in Johannesburg. Most of the foreigners among them speaking Pharaoh's language in accents impossible to understand, from Cockney to Australian. And there was Yiddish and Lithuanian and German and whatnot. These were not God-fearing people. They revered the gold of the Transvaal, not its plains and hills. The foreigners in Johannesburg, outlanders, the pastoralists called them, saw themselves differently than the way white pastoralists saw them. They believed in progress. They were willing to entertain new thoughts. They believed that their enterprise would make life better for everyone. Most came from places that had seen an expansion of knowledge in many fields, from engineering to medicine. They saw the Boer farmers and the government of farmers 30 miles away in Pretoria as backward and ignorant people. Soon, they saw them also as obstacles to progress. The pastoralists dealt easily with each other, accepting the landless white man at table, recognizing no social distinction in him, rather different circumstances of life. The story they loved to relate concerned two sons in doubt as to the fairest division of a farm, their inheritance, who came to their now aging president for advice and received their advice. The elder could make the division and fix the beacons, the younger can take the choice. They were Afrikaners, a people of Africa, who went to their chiefs for advice. Years prior to the reef's discovery, the laws of the Transvaal had forbidden the working of gold mines altogether, many believing that gold does least harm when undiscovered. But on the eve of the discovery, the Transvaal verged on the edge of bankruptcy. Gold mining was then permitted. There seemed no better choice. But this decision brought Transvaalers an onrush of new problems. How to handle the newcomers arriving in ever greater numbers in their midst? They might soon be even outnumbered by foreigners. Indeed, outnumbered by citizens of a country from whose authority they themselves had escaped and from whom they had won the freedom to live as they saw fit. Four years after the reef was found, the waiting period for eligibility to vote was extended from five to fourteen years for new citizens. An immediate fear was assuaged, but a new store of trouble was laid up for another day. But there was no way of avoiding providing some municipal services to the city arising on the Witwatersrand, such as water and sanitation. The simplest way was to pass the responsibility over to a foreigner who visited the government with an offer to handle it himself. And he would pay the government for the privilege, provided he received an exclusive right to set the charges and collect the payments. The way the Romans handled tax collection became the way President Kruger and the Volksrat, the Boer legislature, handled many of the requirements of the new population and the new industry through grants of monopolies. Johannesburgers wanted jam. The mines needed cement and dynamite. Monopolies were granted to provide these items and others. It was rumored that someone had received the monopoly to issue monopolies. Many foreigners, other than those who obtained the monopolies or concessions as they were called, were not pleased. Services like water and sanitation were dismal. Absent market competition all had to pay more for everything from jam to dynamite. The dynamite concessionaire, a go-getter from the London slums, charged the mines an enormous markup. Nine years after the reef was found, state revenue had increased 25-fold. But as this was happening and more and more gold was taken from the ground, the store of troubles laid up for another day kept growing. Also impinging on profitable mine operations was the inadequate supply of African labor. 
All legislators and officials utilizing their own farm laborers in a face-to-face -face manner according to the rhythms of their farms were not keyed to the efficiencies demanded by mine owners. There were too few Africans willing to be recruited as miners and the pay needed to recruit them was too high to satisfy shareholders. The Transvaal government and American engineer declared should, quote, practically compel the native through taxation to contribute his quota to the good of the community. With good government, there will be an abundance of labor. And with an abundance of labor, there will be no difficulty in cutting down wages. But the Boer government was so lax with its controls that a third of the insufficiently numerous mine African labor force was constantly incapacitated by bad liquor smuggled in from Mozambique. For these reasons and others, there was need for good government. Bad government made a difference of up to 3% on the dividend on the best mines, threatened the chance of any dividend on the second best, and made useless working mines with even lower grade ore. So went one calculation. But in the mines especially of those for whom money was but the means to a higher end, there was worse. The Boers, hoping to break out of Britain's commercial stranglehold, had contracted with a Dutch company to build a rail line that didn't end at a British-controlled port. It ended in Lorenzo Marx in Portuguese-run Mozambique. Where would this lead? First, an alternative outlet to the sea. Next, an alliance with Germany. Germany was already threatening Britain's interest to keep its seat as chief world power. It was competing in industrial production and overseas sales. It was arming, building a navy, establishing colonies, one indeed with a border just 500 miles to the west of the Boer Republics. To Rhodes, who in his first will had left the bulk of his anticipated fortune, not to friends and relatives, but to the British colonial secretary and his successors for the extension of British rule throughout the world, including, among other listed projects, the reincorporation of the United States into the British Empire. The Boer Railway was a sign that work needed to be done. As Prime Minister of the Cape Colony, he first tried to squeeze business away from the Boer Railway by lowering freight charges on the lines coming up from the British ports. But the Boers counted by raising fees on the 51-mile section of the line running over Boer territory up from the Far River. To counter this, the Cape Railways began to offload freight into wagons at the Far Drifts, a ford where wagons could cross and continue overland to Johannesburg. The Boers closed the drifts to wagon traffic. Rhodes then offered to purchase Lorenzo Marx from the Portuguese, but under German advice, they refused his offer. Events were heading towards crisis. Vast deposits of coal and iron were discovered in the Transvaal, signaling the beginning of a sustained industrial revolution. The Transvaal, the poor cousin among the white states of South Africa not long before, was promising to become its richest and most powerful state. It was already importing artillery from Europe and had established a military academy. Would the Afrikaner majority in the Cape Colony not be pressured and drawn by the Republic's wealth and power into a movement to unite all Afrikaners outside British leadership? Rhodes was a believer, though an atheist. He believed that the British Empire was the main force for good in the world. Bringing more of the world's peoples into the empire was in humanity's interests, not merely Britain's, and was his life's endeavor. He could not allow this enterprise to founder on the rock of a reactionary state, whose head, Paul Kruger, had called a man a liar for claiming that the earth was round. Rhodes was aware that many in South Africa and in Britain opposed the use of force against the Kruger government. 
In South Africa, Afrikaner members of Rhodes' cabinet in the Cape Colony, Rhodes is seated second from the left, would not countenance violence against their Transvaal kinsmen. German-Jewish mining magnates in Johannesburg, who operated with French and German capital, also stood with Kruger, as did the concessionaires. Even many of the British miners, the best-paid miners in the world, were not looking for trouble. In Britain, Lord Ripon, colonial secretary of the governing Liberal Party, rejected a plan laid before him by a partner in the Witwatersrand's largest mining house that would have him order British forces to support an Oitlander uprising. On the contrary, Ripon said, every nerve should be strained to prevent such a disgrace as a South African war. But the Conservative Party was elected to form the British government in mid-1895, and its colonial secretary was Joseph Chamberlain. Chamberlain represented Birmingham manufacturing interests, fearful that colonial expansion by other European powers would close door after door to British trade. He had made a fortune himself as a screw manufacturer, and had amassed the largest private collection of orchids in Europe. Some people spend their time growing orchids, others spend their time in making empires, Rhodes remarked to friends. But Chamberlain, like Rhodes, believed that unless the Boers were removed from power in the Transvaal, Britain would be removed from the whole of South Africa. And, unlike Rhodes, he sat in London, at the center of British power. Lady Lugard, wife of another empire builder, mutual friend of Rhodes and Chamberlain, herself colonial correspondent of the London Times, began preparing the British public, till then unimpressed by the grievances of prosperous outlanders, for the actions she knew were to come. If the public could go frantic over atrocities in Bulgaria, wrote one member of the media offensive against the Boers, then, quote, if they require atrocities to assist their comprehension of the facts and to disarm their opposition, it should not be difficult to supply the necessary chapter of horrors. While the public was being inflamed, a desert patch of British territory adjacent to the Transvaal's western border was to be transferred to the jurisdiction of Rhodes' private company as a staging area for the company's mounted police force together with British troopers granted leave from their units. A letter was composed imploring the commander of this force, a Rhodes associate, Dr. Leander Jameson, to hurry to the rescue of, quote, thousands of unarmed men, women, and children of our race at the mercy of well-armed Boers. The letter was left undated so that Jameson could add a date when all aspects of the plan were complete. A self-styled reform committee of outlanders went to see President Kruger with a petition to reduce the white male residence requirement for voting from 14 years to 5 years. The committee expected Kruger to refuse, knowing his position. They were allowed into his state to make money, not to run it. The reformers would report his refusal at a big meeting. The insurrection would start. Rifles smuggled in by Rhodes' men would be passed out. They were for enough men to hold Johannesburg just long enough for the telegraph to reach Jameson on the border. He would date the hurry-up appeal in his pocket and bring his mounted troopers with machine guns into Johannesburg. Whether there'd be a fight with Kruger's men or just a standoff didn't matter. Either way, Sir Hercules Robinson, newly appointed British High Commissioner for South Africa, would then play his part. He would journey to Johannesburg and in the broad daylight of the world's press, in the role of peacemaker and problem solver, separate the parties and decide between them. Jameson would produce the telegram with the appeal for immediate help from terrified women and children of our race, clearly justifying the uprising and his intervention. 
Full control of the Transvaal would be over. It was a slam dunk. Among the documents that turned up later was a request by Lady Lugard to the planners to plan not to commence the business, as she put it, on a Saturday, because her paper published only on six days. After all the work she had done to bring the event about, the Sunday papers must not get the scoop. Those in the chain of command all the way up to Rhodes and Chamberlain didn't know that Kruger knew about their plan. There were boys whose job it was to watch the Outlanders and listen to them. Outlanders were talking openly about an uprising, when and how it would take place. Racehorses were being shipped to safety and trains out of Johannesburg were fuller than usual. Planners hadn't anticipated that Outlanders would be quarreling, nor that this would occur right in the open. Some were for an independent Outlander Republic run by themselves as the outcome. Others wanted to join the Transvaal to the Empire. When the time came, too few were ready to take up rifles. Too many had left town or were still arguing. The troopers in the desert took off without a Johannesburg uprising, and so without victims of the expected Boer violence to quell it. Before mounting up, the telegraph wire to Pretoria was cut to preserve the element of surprise, as this drawing purports to depict. However, as later alleged, instead, Troopers in an alcoholic stupor actually cut a length of fencing wire which they carefully buried to make repair more difficult. At any event, the Boers were waiting for Jameson and his force. Jameson was captured. Found himself in a prison cell and then on trial along with his officers and members of the Outlander Reform Committee. Lady Lugard's paper, hoping to still some of the uproar about the resulting fiasco, published a special poem by the Poet Laureate of England who wrote his lines unaware that the urgent appeal telegram had been held undated for 42 days. His poem does reflect the effect of the Conservative Party media's work, the state of opinion to which a prominent section of the British public had been led. When men of our blood pray us to ride to our kinsfolk's aid, not heaven itself shall stay us from the rescue they call a raid. There are girls in the Gold Reef City, there are mothers and children too, and they cry Hurry up for pity, so what can a brave man do? Incriminating documents had been recovered from the prisoners on trial in Pretoria, implicating many others in the chain of command, and suggesting participation by the colonial office, not only by Chamberlain, but also by his second-in-command, who was the Prime Minister's son-in-law. It also became clear that Rhodes's British South Africa Company, which has supplied many of the troopers, had thereby violated its charter, which the British government would now be obliged to revoke. Rather than punish the men on trial, the Boers calculated it would be advantageous to turn them over to the British government for trial. The British government itself, including Chamberlain, would then be on the spot. If the raiders weren't punished, the world would wonder why. Why had the War Office granted Army officers leave to guard a piece of empty desert? If they were punished, they might try to save themselves by saying the mission had been officially sanctioned. Now, the world press had a different story to follow than a supposed rescue raid. How would the British government play the fact of the invasion of a country whose government had done nothing to terrify any Boers or Britons? Chamberlain, as colonial secretary, was on the parliamentary committee of inquiry set up to find out. Both he, wearing his trademark monocle and orchid, and Rhodes, 
sitting in the left foreground, had powerful paper shields in their pockets. Chamberlain had the charter of the British South African Company ready to be revoked if Rhodes dared to exculpate himself by pulling out the sheaf of cables he possessed that would have established Chamberlain's complicity. There occurred a not uncommon dance, the lying in state at Westminster, as a British comic described this particular inquiry. Chamberlain was not officially implicated and lost nothing. His political influence grew. This is but one of his monuments in Birmingham. Rhodes, this is one of his monuments, having lost the trust of Cape Afrikaners, was forced to resign the premiership of the Cape Colony. He spent no jail time. He told the Kaiser of Germany, I was a naughty boy, but I never got whipped at all. There was no avoiding putting Jameson and his officers on trial. Jameson got a 15-month prison sentence. Served four months, in later life he was knighted. His officers received prison sentences and lost their commissions in the army as well. The momentum of imperial expansion was merely delayed. Chamberlain was left in place to plan a surer solution to the Boer problem than the flawed Jameson raid. He sent Sir Alfred later Lord Milner as new High Commissioner to South Africa to replace the compromised Sir Hercules Robinson. The growing industrial strength of the South African Republic was as clear to Milner as it was to the Colonial Secretary. As clear to both was the South African Republic's attempts at outreach to Britain's rivals. And it wouldn't take long for the Afrikaners in the Cape to see that Britain could not only be defied, but perhaps ousted from the entire country. As Milner put it, would the French Canadians remain loyal to Britain if the United States were a French Republic? Milner and Chamberlain were efficient in organizing an atmosphere of hatred for the Kruger regime in Britain and throughout the empire along with sympathy for the plight of the Outlanders. Hundreds of thousands attended meetings in Britain and elsewhere to hear the message. More than a million pamphlets were passed out in Britain. Kruger should know it wasn't just the Outlanders that were against him, and not all of the Outlanders were against him, he well knew, but it was the whole British Empire that was against him and the empire would not stand down. Kruger, who had wanted nothing to do with the British Empire, since he had walked with the four truckers as a child, retreated and played for time. He agreed to reduce the residence requirement governing Outlander eligibility to vote. He would halve the requirement, thereby perhaps shorten the number of years of his people's control. In the interim, by arms, hopefully obtain support from Germany. For Milner, Kruger's concessions on the Outlander vote was not what he wanted. He didn't want a regime change and the possibility of an Outlander Republic. An Outlander Republic controlling the world's greatest gold deposits would be no better than Kruger's Republic. He wanted to guarantee that Transvaal would become part of the empire. Direct negotiations between the Transvaal government and the leading mining houses to settle the Outlander issue were sabotaged by a Rhodes associate through a leak to the press. The intensifying campaign of hatred for the Boers and their government disturbed the general commanding British forces in South Africa, who was under the mistaken impression that he was there to preserve the peace. He telegraphed the war office, Persistent efforts of a party to produce war form gravest threat in the situation here. I believe that war would be the greatest calamity that ever occurred in South Africa. Milner asked for his recall. Another commander was sent in his place. The capstone of the campaign came in a telegram for publication Milner sent to Chamberlain. 
British subjects in the Transvaal were being treated like helots, and allowing this to continue was damaging Britain's position in the world. The helots were a conquered people terrorized by their foreign masters, the Spartans, on occasion killed by them. Here was Queen Victoria's High Commissioner saying that the Kruger regime was terrorizing British subjects and killing them. Kruger then saw that Britain wanted war, not negotiations. They do not want any franchise under a republic, he said. The empire was going to join in the attack. Empire troops were being offloaded from troop ships. When he saw the situation getting hopeless fast, he ordered his boers to attack. They were not alone. Here, President Steyn of the Orange Free State is seen outside Bloemfontein, its capital, asking his burghers to join their kinsmen of the Transvaal. Milner and Chamberlain didn't calculate well how long the war would last, its cost to the British taxpayer, the number of lives that would be lost, the damage that would be done, and the feelings that would be left still raw after more than a hundred years. The music in the background is a song about a Boer general in that war that became a runaway hit among Afrikaners in South Africa when it was released in 2006. In British history, there had never been as large a commitment of troops. More than 400,000 men, many from Canada and Australia and other parts of the empire, served in South Africa during the campaign. More than 200,000 of them at one time. Fifty-four thousand Boers fought in the war. The young, the mature and the old. The war lasted two and a half years, far longer than expected by the British public, and it damaged rather than raised British prestige. After withstanding the initial Boer offensive, it was relatively easy militarily for the British forces to advance up the railway lines and establish control of towns and cities along the way, like Bloemfontein, then towns further up, then Johannesburg and Pretoria, and to chase Paul Kruger up the Boer railway line to the Mozambique border and into exile in Europe for the remainder of his life. But this didn't end the war. For two more years, bridges and supply trains would be blown up. British troops continually killed and wounded, more than 21,000 of them, as against 4,000 Boers who lost their lives. All this while, anti-British sentiment built up in Europe and the United States. Dismay and anti-war sentiment spread even within Britain itself as the costs began to be reckoned. To end the war, the British applied scorched earth. They had the troops destroy in part or whole more than 40 small towns and villages. Burn 30,000 farm buildings in the Transvaal and Free State. Slaughter all the poor animals. Salt their fields, poison their wells. Drive the farm women and children into concentration camps in ox wagons or open cattle trucks. Salon, som jag fall,
Nearly 28,000, one out of four inmates, died there. Young and old whose men were fighting were issued no meat in the camps. African and colored servants were taken to separate camps. No mortality records were kept for them. The Earl of Middleton, Secretary of War, declared in Parliament that the camps were purely voluntary and their inmates were comfortable and contented. Still the war continued. Finally, the British commander found the winning strategy. The families were released from the concentration camps and returned to their ruined farms to become a burden on the fighters. The fighters couldn't handle both their hungry, bedraggled families and the fight. Peace was signed on the 31st of May, 1902. The Afrikaner writer Herman Charles Busman describes in a short story, One Man's Homecoming. I was in the felt when they made peace. Then we laid down our rifles and went home. What I knew my farm by was the hole under the hill where I quarried slate stones for the threshing floor. That was about all that remained as I had left it. Everything else was gone. My home was burned down. My lands were laid waste. My cattle and sheep were slaughtered. Even the stones I had for the crawls were pulled down. My wife came out of the concentration camp and we went together to look at our old farm. My wife had gone into the concentration camp with our two children and she came out alone. And when I saw her again and noticed the way she had changed, I knew that I, who had been all through the fighting, had not seen the Boer War. On the eve of the war's outbreak, when the pressure for war had reached its peak, Lord Salisbury, Britain's Prime Minister, and Chamberlain's and Milner's superior, wrote to his Secretary for War, saying that he was left with no choice now but war, as a result of Milner's activities. We have to act upon a moral field prepared by him and his Jingo supporters. But the field had been prepared long before Milner was appointed High Commissioner. The Anglo-Boer War ended the political divisions in South Africa and began entwining the fates of the different peoples more firmly than ever before. The fate of each of these peoples then began uninterruptedly to affect the condition of all the others. In its immediate wake, the war left behind it greater poverty among both formerly African farmers, many now laboring on white farms or in the mines, and it left greater poverty among mainly Afrikaner whites, who now found themselves among South Africa's defeated peoples. But the victory was not as the victors had imagined. English speakers were a minority of the white population. For them to try to control South Africa alone in the face of general Afrikaner hostility would have been difficult, to say the least, and impossible after the British electorate in 1906 voted out the party that had led them to war. A deal was struck. The country would become united as the Union of South Africa, but under the British crown. This was the Union flag until 1928, a British red ensign. That was one part of the deal. It was also agreed that the process of industrialization would continue on free enterprise lines, on lines considered best by rural and urban management of labor. But the Union of South Africa would be led by the winners of national parliamentary elections in which the majority of voters would be Afrikaners. Afrikaners would lead the Union, 
Three of them board generals or commandants in the war, one of whom got rid of the red ensign for a flag in which Britain's flag shared equal billing in the center with flags of the Boer republics. Under this flag, Afrikaners, in 1961, led South Africa right out of the British Commonwealth. But this is only a small portion of a reality so different from imperial dreams. Louis Botha, a Boer general in the war and with substantial farm property, was the principal Afrikaner participant in the deal. He became leader of the first Union government until his death in 1919. He was succeeded by the Deputy Prime Minister, Jan Smuts, another principal participant in the settlement of the war, during which he had led a commando raid into the Cape Colony. He came from a wealthy family. He had been educated at Cambridge and admired the British, and along with Louis Buta took South Africa into World War I on Britain's side against Germany. Both then put on British military uniforms. Smuts later took South Africa into World War II on Britain's side, in both cases against very great opposition from other Afrikaners. Overwhelmingly, Afrikaans speaking were, quote, so poor that they cannot adequately feed and clothe their children, unquote. 300,000 were counted as dependent on charity for support or subsisting in, quote, dire poverty on farms. This photo of a boy living on a diet of maize meal and black coffee, and like photos among those that follow, were taken by the Carnegie Commission members. White poverty did not begin with the destruction of Afrikaner towns and farmhouses during the Anglo-Boer War. Its origin dates to the landing of the first black slaves in South Africa, when almost all socially acceptable means of livelihood for many white males without land or businesses of their own became closed off by slave labor. Some whites without inherited property lived off welfare in Cape Town. Others, as we have seen, trekked into the wilderness with a few sheep and cattle. Already, the condition of one people was affecting the condition of another. But the land frontier also ended by the time almost nine-tenths of the land was occupied by white owners. Those with the land then began dividing their farms among their sons. After a few generations, this, the Connie Commission saw, was the portion of one man's inheritance, less than half an acre. A little sit plucky, a little perch, and a little debt, or the next blast of nature, would be enough to drive the owner off his perch. Drought was one such blast. The terrible cattle disease, Rinderpest, was another. More and more of those who still had animals lost them. They were then effectively landless. Some became sharecroppers. Some were taken in by a boar who was still afloat to become a babe owner, a kind of helper out, who sat at table with the owner. Then came diamonds and gold. The mines and the cities they spawned provided landless whites with a livelihood as transport riders from the ports. But railroads put an end to this employment. Sons and grandsons of the four trekkers came to towns and cities where in most cases English was the lingua franca. They were, as imagined by the Africana poet, G.A. Vardamaya, stepchildren, 
getting off at stations, small specks against the blind horizon. Cities didn't want them. Undesirable influx was the verdict, one official commission which investigated the poor white population of Pretoria reported. Their presence in the city is, quote, not desirable from an economic and moral standpoint, unquote. Many were turned down for jobs in the mines, wherever they looked. The Jingo's villain need in Inkele Boer Werk gefed. The Jingo's won't give work to a single boar. We hewed open the wide plains, where mine constructions grow from reefs, where shopping centers reach the clouds, wrote Vortemeyer. But they expected to be paid more than a black man with the same working skills, and they were harder to control. The trouble with white laborers, in addition to what they expected to be paid, according to the director of South Africa's largest diamond mine, was... Quote, you could not search them, and you could not put them in a compound. You could not put them in detention houses at the end of the period of service to see that they do not take any diamonds out. To be perfectly candid, you would have them on strike. You cannot have a big industry like that, dependent upon labor, that can any day go out. The South African economy and the economies affected by it needed to keep unskilled labor cheap. Making businesses have to pay more to unwanted white hires than to black hires wasn't what the governing party led by Buta and Smuts was about. The Buta Smuts administration did make Dingan's Day, December 16th, the day of the Battle of Blood River, the national holiday but it did little to assure poor Africana urban migrants an opportunity to earn a livelihood. We have wife and children who have to eat and there is nothing to live on, went one appeal from poor Africaners. We don't expect office work, but any sort of work, either with pick and shovel on the railroad and in the streets or country roads, and where you hire kaffirs, we can be taken instead. Many of these men had also fought in the wars and were descendants of the Fort Trekkers. In fact, the government made the condition of poor Afrikaners worse. It enacted a land act prohibiting Africans from purchasing or renting land in almost 90% of the country. Africans collectively have been buying farms at depressed prices Putting a stop to this meant that even more Africans than otherwise were trekking to towns and cities, searching for livelihood. These were people willing to offer their bodies at a wage lower than the lowest wage. The 1930 Land Act was good for English-speaking businessmen, not for the jobless Africana. Who would want to hire him now, especially when African labor had been made even cheaper by the Land Act. In his poem, The Disinherited, the poet Vortemeyer speaks for them in these lines in translation. The landless reading agriculture, inspanning in their minds at crack of dawn, still after twilight in the city, at bedtime note the clouds for rain deeply grateful when the rain blesses iron roofs with harvest dreams. How were they to care for themselves? They had become strangers in cities of the land their ancestors had conquered. The names etched on office doors when the adults sought employment were not Afrikaans' names, and the men inside these offices neither spoke nor understood their language. They faced two challenges. One was from employers who didn't want them. The other was from Africans whom the employers wanted. These challenges to livelihood led in 1922 to the last violent clash of magnitude between white people. 
On one side were not only Afrikaner work seekers, but also English speaking skilled and semi skilled miners. On the other, mine owners and managers and the government. Priorities of each side were completely at odds. Mine owners and managers were directly responsible for the mines. The price at which gold sold had fallen dramatically. They had to cut expenses or see mines close. White miners in South Africa were paid far more for the same work than miners in Europe, North America, and Australia, while black mine laborers in South Africa were paid far less for the same work than was paid to laborers in Europe, North America, and Australia. The only possibility that made any business sense in South Africa's gold price crisis was to replace white men in a series of semi-skilled trades, drill sharpener, engine driver, track layer, carpenter, and others, with an equal number of black men. Black men were actually doing the work of these trades, for which whites were collecting the pay. So no output would be lost. Why not make the native the real miner and thus save much of the money paid to white men for work they never perform? The mine owner Sir George Albu had written even before the 1921 drop in gold prices. So, English speaking white men about to lose their jobs and Afrikaners afraid they would never get a job formed armed commandos. They proclaimed Johannesburg and the mining towns an independent republic, a white man's country in which blacks would not be allowed. Some, desperate with fear for the welfare of their own families, bludgeoned and murdered any African they happened to see. African dead are being removed under escort. Underlining the tragedy of these events was the fact that had the white workers and would-be workers succeeded in making the Witwatersrand a white man's country, where white men and women did all the work, the idea that later became known as apartheid, the mines would have closed at an even faster pace. Smuts, who was now in charge, could see the senselessness of what was taking place. He ordered out the military. The South African Defense Force made bombing and strafing raids on the main white working class districts of Johannesburg and other Witwatersrand cities, shelled them with artillery fire and fired from tanks. More than 200 people were killed, more than a thousand persons were injured, Africans, white miners, poor whites, troops and police. The revolt of white against white was suppressed, and the mines came back into operation with fewer white operatives and more black workers. When the time came for voting in 1924, two political parties, one the National Party, led by another former Boer War general, J.B.M. Herzog, representing the interests of Afrikaner work-seekers, farmers, and some professionals. The other, the South African Labour Party, representing English-speaking workers, decided to cooperate and not contest seats in districts where their respective supporters were most concentrated. Smuts and his South Africa Party were defeated. The new government divided ministries among the coalition's leaders. But the party's goals were not identical. The Labour Party, with its constituency of white workers and work seekers, wanted to send all blacks to those pieces of land remaining to them after the conquest. The population of the major part of South Africa should consist of whites only, and they would do all the work there. But the National Party could not accept this. Its principal constituency were Afrikaner farmers. Their economy was critically dependent on black and colored labor. The very idea of white men doing all the work was out of the question. There were no white men willing to do the work a farm owner wanted done, 
at a wage the farmer could afford. Indeed, their need for African labor was such that one of the jobs of the police became that of supplying farmers with men like these, arrested for not producing a pass with written permission to be in a proclaimed white area. Their labor cost the farmer nothing other than food and the cost of erecting farm jails to house them. Complete racial separation or apartheid, as the idea was termed when it resurfaced in the second half of the 20th century, was put on the back burner. Instead, the immediate needs of National and Labour Party supporters were accommodated. White workers were protected from black competition in the mines and factories by law. A whole series of job titles were reserved legally for whites only including those that had led to the 1922 White Revolt. Meanwhile, the gold price had risen, enabling the mines to absorb the extra costs of having to pay whites whom they didn't need or want. Many blacks were dismissed on the books as drill sharpers, but they continued to sharpen the drills. The needs of poor white work seekers were also attended to. There were job training programs, maternity grants, labor colonies, public feeding schemes for their children were initiated. Livelihoods were found for their parents and brothers. In the public sector, the government acted with dispatch. African and colored cleaners were told to leave government offices. Poor whites were taken on. Poor white men were given livelihoods in the field of unskilled labor that had been close to them since the first slave had landed. More than 10,000 poor blacks on the government-owned railways were dismissed and more than 10,000 poor whites were taken on. The cost of transportation went up and everything became dearer. Food became dearer. The men who had been dismissed became more desperate. The bags of maize meal they had bought for their families became so expensive some had to do without. In one area, where hospital records were kept, people were dying of starvation. The district registrar's office refused to accept the term starvation on the death certificates and returned them to the doctors. Public service employment became the largest employment category for whites, more than private industry. By 1953, more than 100,000 whites were working for the railways, then the greatest employer of white labor in the country. But the government did not ignore private industry. Tariff protection from foreign competition was offered companies who agreed to increase the ratio of white to non-white in their labor force and denied to or withdrawn from companies which refused to assume the extra costs this entailed. Likewise, government purchases were directed to companies that maintained an approved white to non-white employment ratio. A civilized labor policy, it was called officially. Despite the civilized labor policy, nearly 300,000 whites were counted as living in, quote, terrible poverty, unquote, in 1939, on the eve of the Second World War. During the war, output of South African manufacturing and processing almost doubled. There were large increases in employment of all races, the largest increase being black employment, along with increases in wages all around. When the war ended, the poor white problem had receded. The South African Board of Trade and Industries explained that the growth of white employment was due to the wartime expansion of the non-white consumer market. The civilized labor policy relieved white unemployment and provided landless Afrikaners with a protected route into the industrial economy. But it did not by itself eliminate white poverty. Because it involved an ever greater input for no increase in output, it reduced the national income. Although the burdens in the form of higher costs fell most heavily on those without the power for half a century, 
to refuse them, the material growth of the whole society was retarded. Whatever success the civilized labor policy had, it succeeded only in creating Africana employment in the lower ranks of white employees, in private industry almost entirely run by English speakers, yet even in the public sector. The top levels of the public service in at least 22 departments of state, including even the Department of Native Administration, which administered the laws affecting black people, were until after 1948 populated predominantly by English speakers. These officials weren't bothering to learn Afrikaans. Many of them were placed into position by the Milner administration after the Anglo-Boer War in order, as Milner put it, to break the dominion of Afrikanerdom. But equality of the two languages was part of the bargain that had ended the Anglo-Boer War. It was enshrined in the Act of Union. Civil servants had by law to be able to speak the other white language fluently within five years of employment. This is the monument to the Afrikaans language that was erected in 1975, only 19 years before all whites lost their monopoly of power. Language is more than a symbolic issue. Department heads were the most highly paid. They picked their successors, who controlled employment down the line. Agreement to observe language equality had made a measure of reconciliation possible between the two groups. Department heads could not even speak the language of their white clerks and cleaners. Monuments to the struggle of Boer versus Britain dot the landscape, most placed there in the years after the Second World War, and almost up to the time the struggle between the white ethnicities ended in black rule. Here in open countryside men erected a reminder to other Afrikaners and anyone else who happened to take notice that the struggle for Boer independence was continuing despite the end of armed resistance. That armed resistance was not forgotten. Sixty Afrikaner fighters killed by British troops in the last organized battle of the Anglo-Boer War were remembered with the erection of this monument, nearly 70 years after the event. Eleven years later, in 1981, the concentration camp Garden of Remembrance was dedicated in a small town in the Northern Cape Province. Nothing was forgotten. These memories helped elect, in 1948, the first white government in which all cabinet posts were held by Afrikaners. At this time, one in 20 of the country's company directors was an Afrikaner. 86% of white unskilled workers were Afrikaners. The struggle which had left Afrikaners defeated and impoverished after a war for control of the city of gold, Johannesburg, was far from over. We'll take its courtyard and its gates, the poet Vardamea promised. Systematically, the new government and the Afrikaner public proceeded to push open the gates. Afrikaners were urged to donate to help establish an Afrikaans medical faculty in Pretoria. Donate to fund an engineering faculty at the University of Stellenbosch. They were urged to invest Afrikaans. If we want to achieve success, said the managing director of Sanla, once a small Afrikaner insurance company that would become an industry leader, we must make use of the technique of capitalism as it is employed in the most important industry of our country, the gold mining industry. We must establish a financial company which will function in commerce and industry like the so-called finance houses in Johannesburg. Working together, Afrikaners established their first investment company, Federale Volksbelegings. It became a giant of the South African economy. A bank started with little capital, Volkskas, the people's chest, became one of South Africa's leading financial institutions, helped by small depositors 
and by the government directly through deposits of public money collected in taxes from white mine owners and black miners and everyone else. With public money, the government directly financed and created new industries. Twenty years earlier, the Nationalist Labor Pact government had created a state corporation to produce iron and steel. Two years after coming into office, the new nationalist government created the South African Coal, Oil and Gas Corporation, SASOL. South Africa has coal, but no oil. Utilizing a method developed by the Germans during World War II to turn coal into gasoline, SASOL was producing more than 10% of the country's liquid fuel requirements by 1978. Its sales climbed to about 10 billion. It employed 30,000, including the largest number of PhDs of any company in the Southern Hemisphere. A host of other state-assisted enterprises were developed in which Afrikaans was the language of the Board of Directors. State capitalism accounted for one-fifth of all white employment. By the 1980s, Afrikaners were well represented in all the professions in commerce, manufacturing and mining, and they were in full charge of the military. Their average per capita income had risen to about 80% of English speakers' earnings. They could begin to dream of the future rather than the past. Imagine, if you will, a country where the people have no class or finesse, where every little child grows up in the wild and the hairy, horrid parents can't care less. It's a shame what the colonies have come to. We've let them rule themselves for far too long. Our people there have no one there to run to. We must show them that Britannia is strong. Now imagine, if you will, a people ruled by a bearded, boorish beast. I tell you it is treason, and Kruger is the reason he should be hanged from the gallows at the least. So if it's war that they want, then they'll get it. They've told us there's a fight and where it is, and if some blood should spill, then let it. We are sad to oblige, but there it is. There it is. I must warn you, my lord, the Boers are a formidable foe. Imagine, if you will, an army that has fought in every country in the world. From the east to the west, we have conquered all the best. There's not a sea where our sails aren't unfurled. And you say that the Boers will stand up to this force, this armada, this machine. A ragged bunch of peasants who look up to the power and the might of our queen. Now imagine, if you will, an army with no discipline nor organized brigade. I tell you that the lot will surrender at first shot. We'll be home before the Christmas cakes are made. So if it's war that they want, then they'll get it. They've told us there's a fight and where it is. And if some blood should spill, then let it. We are sorry to oblige, but there it is. There it is. Imagine, if you will, an ore of gold descending to the bowels of the earth. More than all the mines of the world combined, imagine, my dear fellow, what that's worth. It is wealth for the building of an empire, riches for the glory of the crown, treasure that will raise our nation higher. If you're not going up, you're going down, 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 down. Now imagine, if you will, a people, a nation of Neanderthals at best, it's an insult to behold them sitting on that gold until we've got it, I shall never let it rest. So if it's war that they want, then they'll get it. They've told us there's a fight and where it is. And if their blood should spill, then let it. We are happy to oblige. So you would start a war for gold? Yes, deplorable, I know. But there it is. There it is.
Op de bergen die nacht, lee ons een donker in wacht. En die modder in bloed, lee hij koud, streepzak in riemt leeft in mij. En bij huis in mijn plaats, tot koele verbrand, zodat so hij ons kan vangen. Maar die vlammen in vier branden nou diep, diep binnen mij. Wat lag, een handje van ons, die een hele groot mag. In die graanse leeg hier, die in ons rug, alle dunkt is voorbij. Maar die hart van een boer, de dieper en weier, alle gaan het nog zien. Op een berg kom hij aan, die liefde. Van die West Transvaal. 